here tonight to study the Bible. And it is a blessing to learn from the Word of God. What do you say? Amen. All right. Uh, the Bible says uh, God's people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. Uh, it's good to come to church and celebrate. Come to church and hear testimonies. But it is more important to come to church to learn. So that you know why you believe what you believe. Uh, the Jehovah Witness Church is good at that. That's why it's difficult to move a Jehovah Witness from what he believes. They are always studying. Uh, Protestant churches have moved away from studying and it's now more celebration. So there's so much celebrating in church and less learning and that puts us in a dangerous position where the devil can easily deceive the people of God. I believe that in these last days, the concentration in the Seventh-day Adventist church must be teaching. More teaching and less preaching. So I'm so happy that you came tonight so we could teach and we could learn. Amen. Let me share our condolences to our brother who lost his father last night and the young man who had asked us to pray for his grandfather. Uh, it is evident that it, it is the will of God that granddaddy sleep in Jesus. There are those that the Lord will put to sleep because it is not his will for them to go through the final tribulation. And some of us may go through that tribulation. But as long as granddaddy is asleep in Jesus, the Bible says, you will see him when he resurrects on that day when Jesus comes again. Amen? Uh, I would like to say thank you to the brother who has been singing every night. It's one of the male voices that I've come to love in our churches. What you hear is the man's voice. He doesn't have to make up anything. He opens his mouth, and that's how he sounds. And that is a blessing. Uh, my brother, may the Lord bless you. I'd like to give you one piece of counsel. People are not interested in hearing the preacher preach the same sermon. But they will always want to hear the singer sing the same song. Which means... What stays in people's minds more is what you will sing and not what a preacher will preach. You have to keep in mind that when you stand here to sing, people may say, sing it again. But when the preacher preaches, it doesn't matter how much they enjoy it, they never say, preach it again. So you are in a position as a singer to impact the minds of people so much that it means your life must be consecrated. Amen? The preacher as well. But the fact that people will come and pay to hear a singer sing. Nobody pays to, well, they pay to go hear Joel Osteen, but <laughs> sing for the Lord, brother. Consecrate your voice and your all to the Lord. So that when you sing, the church is not entertained. The church is led to worship. Amen. Amen? Thank you so much. I don't know who's going to be the singer for next week. I'll try my best to, to maintain the standard. <laughs> so who, you never know. I might come here and open my voice and I know it doesn't matter how I sung, you're going to say amen. That's what we do in the church. And then you're going to go home and say, that pastor, you really can't sing it. And then I'll come and sing the next night, and you're going to shout amen, and then go home and bad talk me again. <laughs> Thank you, brother. God bless you. All right. Do you still have CDs remain? How many do you have remain? About 10? Okay. Buy some CDs tonight, brethren. You see, this is why it's very difficult for singers in our churches to live off of that ministry. Because we're so flippant. 
We're so unsupportive of, all, of those who've been given that talent. But we come out in our hundreds to hear the preacher. And there are singers who, they want to dedicate their lives totally to singing for the Lord. But they're scared because you're not going to support them. If he has CDs, take some extra money, buy the CDs, let the man go home to his family and feel good that the church supported him well. Amen. Remember, he can't live off your amens. It means nothing to him. <laughs> buy the CDs. Buy it. Give it to a friend. Give it to a sister. Give it to a visitor. And support his ministry. I'm going to be standing right at that door. Nobody leaves without a CD in their hand. The deacon's going to be there. We're going to lock it down. <laughs> Brother, get the CDs ready. The brethren goes, go, go buy you out tonight. You're laughing and saying amen. I hope you keep your word. God bless you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your blessings. Tonight, we are hungry, Lord. There is a hunger in us that you've put for your word. Feed us, Lord, through the Holy Spirit. Bless the listeners as they listen that your spirit will remind them to pray for me so that even though I'm going to begin now with your spirit, I will not let go of his hand while I'm presenting. But from beginning to end, it will be the voice and the work of the Holy Ghost. So Lord, thank you for your presence with us and bless this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I hope you have your notebooks and your pen. We, are trans we have transitioned into what type of food? Rice. Rice. Okay. Sabbath morning will be dumplings. Yeah, I don't want to take too much time with rice. We start with dumplings from Sabbath morning. Next week, I'm going to give you another kind of food. It's going to be sugar cane. I just added another one. Sugar cane. There's no sugar cane. It's very hard on the outside, but once you get through that skin, it's sweet. We're going to be talking about under the law... And under grace. How many of you want to learn what that means? What it means to be under the law. What it means to be under grace. Next week I'll teach you a subject entitled. Why Saturday is not the Sabbath. Yes. So please. Please come next week. Why Saturday is not the Sabbath. Adventists should not teach that Saturday is the Sabbath. Tell all your Adventist friends to come. All right. We're going to learn that next week. I know you think that I'm crazy, but that's why my wife loves me. She loved the crazy man. But that's for next week. And if we have enough time, if we have enough time, I would like to teach you the subject speaking in tongues and falling in the spirit. I would like, if we have enough time, if we don't have enough time, then I'll just stay another week. <laughs> I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Y'all broke already. <laughs> All right, so just, we just clean this first, take this off. Not everything. All right, just want some space for my writer. My, my, my scribe is doing a good job, amen? All right. Now, let's move on. Last night we talked about Israel. We talked about the three R's. Redemption, relationship, and what? Reward. These are the three stages of the plan of salvation. All right? This is... I'd like to take you now to one text in the Old Testament where... God himself identifies these three stages as he talked with Moses. Uh, Exodus chapter 6. We will read three verses and you will see the three hours right there. Exodus chapter 6 verses 7, 8, and 9. It said, and I will take you to me for a people. 
And I will be to you a God, and you will be... Oh, let's, let's begin instead from verse 6, sorry. Exodus chapter 6 from verse 6. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burden, burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Which one of the R is that one? Redemption. Let's see now relationship. Verse 7. And I will take you to me for a people. And I will be to you a God, and you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Which are is that? Relationship. After he redeems them, he says, now you will be my people, I will be your God. That is relationship. And now we go to the final hour. And I will bring you in unto the land concerning which I did swear to give it to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Say amen. amen. And so ladies and gentlemen, right there in Exodus, we have the three hours. Do not forget that text. Because when you teach it to your friends, because remember, the church must not only win people when we have a campaign. You are supposed to go and teach people the gospel and bring them to the Lord. Don't wait for the church to plan a campaign to win some people for the Lord. You're supposed to be doing that in your town, in your village, in your home, in your school, on your job. So take the text down so when you teach it, you can show the people redemption, relationship, and what? Reward right there in Exodus. That text now sets the base for what we're going to do tonight. Uh, last night, we concluded by understanding baptism, yeah? That when a person receives Jesus as his Savior, he does that while he's in spiritual Egypt, darkness. However, God comes into the dark to save you. He doesn't stay in the dark with you. He's the God of light. He comes in there because that's where you are. He finds you, saves you through the blood of the Lamb. Then he wants now to bring you into the wilderness. Israel began their relationship with God where? In the wilderness. The plan was that there in the wilderness they would be transformed in their relationship with God. So that when they get into Canaan. They will get into Canaan as bright lights for the God that delivered them. Amen, everybody? Good, so that's the plan. For us, ladies and gentlemen, this world is spiritual Egypt. This world is a world of darkness. The devil is called the prince of this world. He is the prince of darkness. Yeah? Good. When you receive Jesus... You then begin a relationship with him in the wilderness. Why is Christianity the religion in the wilderness? All other religion exists in Egypt. I'll say that again. All other religions exist in Egypt. But Christianity and Christians must understand that Christianity is a religion that exists in the wilderness. Which means, because the wilderness is empty, you must learn to live by grace. I'll say it again. There is no bank in the wilderness. So stop believing that God is your bank. Stop looking for prosperity. There is no bank in the wilderness. There is no hospital in the wilderness. So God doesn't have to heal you. Hmm. Yeah? There is no grocery, no supermarket in the wilderness. 
That's why God, Jesus, gave a message to those who live in the wilderness. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and everything else you need will be added unto you. Never said he's a supermarket to you. In the wilderness, there is no bank, there is no supermarket, there is no hospital. What does that mean? Once you choose Jesus and begin a relationship with him, you must learn to live by grace. Amen. Amen. That's why the Lord says, if my people who were called by my name would humble themselves and seek my what? My face. He didn't say my hands. My face. So Christianity is a religion in the wilderness. Now, you must remain there in your relationship with God. And when Jesus comes again, he finds you here in a relationship with God. And you are rewarded with what? Don't whisper, I can't hear you. Eternal life. Amen, everybody? Now, there are theological terminologies for these three stages. Justification, sanctification, glorification. These are the theological terminologies. When you accept Jesus, you are justified. You are declared righteous, not because you are righteous, but because Jesus covers you with his righteousness. Amen. Good. Your relationship with God, the theological terminology for that is sanctification. Sanctification is a spiritual process. That spiritual process includes two things. How many things? Two things. So get ready to write. Sanctification is a spiritual process that includes two things. One changes. The other is transformation. What are the two things? Changes and what? Transformation. Transformation. Here we go. Changes are what you need to do. Transformation is what God does. You cannot transform yourself. That's his work. But you could make changes. It is not God who has to go to your home, pick up the bottle of rum, and throw it away. You got to do that, not the spirit. It is not the Spirit of God that has to go home, sister, and take up the DVDs or delete the movies with all the immorality and the cussing and sorcery and all of that and delete them or throw them away. That's not the work of the Spirit. That's your job. That's called changes. The Bible puts it this way, walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit is your job. Living in the Spirit is God's job. Because to live, you need life. You cannot give yourself life. God gives you life. But it's not God that has to move the right foot and the left foot after he gives you life. Who got to move your feet? You. So walking in the Spirit is your responsibility. Is that clear, everybody? When there are changes, you've made a decision. You're not going to go there. You're not going to eat this. You're not going to drink that. You're going to change that. You're not going to hang out with these friends no more. Those are changes that you make. The Spirit of God performs transformation, which is your, the, transform, the transforming of your attitude towards the food, the drink, the friends, the movies. He does that for you. Is that clear, everybody? When you have both working together, you have sanctification. Is that clear? Yes or no? Have you ever heard people say, you have nothing to do? Jesus did it all. Uh, and you have nothing to do? It's all by grace. It ain't true. If I have nothing to do, then I shouldn't have to pray. I shouldn't have to read my Bible because Jesus did it all. Don't come and tell me i got to pray. Why should I pray if Jesus did it all? And you ever heard people say, oh, Jesus kept the law for us. We don't have to keep the law. He prayed too. 
Why don't you go and say, Jesus prayed for me. I don't have to pray anymore. Is that clear? You understanding, ladies and gentlemen? I told you we switch already for milk. This is not rice. Not everybody going to like what they'll hear from this time on till we end. All right? It's rice now. So here we go. You make changes. You make decisions to get rid of this and get rid of that as the Spirit of God transforms your attitude, transforms your mind, gives you a new focus. And when you have these two together, you got sanctification. Amen? And then when Jesus comes, that's very simple. You got glorification. I'd like to take you to uh, Revelation for a little bit. Revelation, because I'm, I'm gearing up to prepare you for uh, a teaching that I hope is going to be a big blessing for you. The Bible says, Jesus says, I am Alpha, and who can tell me? Alpha and what? Omega. The beginning and the end. Let's put Alpha and Omega up on the board. Alpha. Where would you put Alpha? Under which word? Where would you put Alpha? Under which of these, in which column would you put Alpha? Justification, yes. I am Alpha. Very good. Where would you put Omega? Where? Glorification. Put Omega there. Wonderful. Omega. I want you to see something this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said, I am Alpha and I am Omega. I am the beginning and I am the ending. I am the beginning by myself. I am the ending by myself, which means when it comes to justification, it's Jesus alone. When it comes to glorification, it's Jesus alone. If Jesus is Alpha and Jesus is Omega, who's in the middle? I say it again. If Jesus is Alpha, by himself, and he is Omega, by himself, him alone. Who is in the middle? Jesus and you. So here you put Jesus and you. Now if you look at the board, you will understand why it's Jesus and you. There's an operative word somewhere in here that proves that it's Jesus and you. Who can tell me? Which is the operative word in here? Relationship. Jesus can't have no relationship with himself. He must have a relationship with somebody else. Amen. And the only people who need sanctification are sinners. Not his father. Not the Holy Ghost. And he will have no relationship with Satan. So the only people that he can have a relationship with to, 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 for the process of sanctification are sinners who need to be sanctified. So in the middle here, it's Jesus and you. You want to see it in the Bible? You want to see it? Here we go. Revelation chapter 22. We're going to read two texts that proves that Jesus is Alpha and Omega, but he's not in the middle by himself. Let's go. Revelation 22, verse 13. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. That's just Jesus. Amen. That's just Jesus. So that's why on the board you have Alpha, Jesus, Omega, Jesus. That's what he said. You want to see the part in the middle now? Say yes, preacher. Yes. The people on the right are so quiet. You know why you're so quiet? 
You're lonely. Y'all are lonely. If you had sat down on this side, you'll feel the energy. We got energy on this side. But no, you want to go all over there. Y'all lonely. Y'all okay? Yeah, see, they can't talk. Yeah. But we're glad you're here. God bless you. Let's see the middle now. And we will show why this is the middle part. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and they may enter in through the gates into the city. That's the next verse. How do we know that that's the part in the middle? You all ready? Let me put it up on the board for you. When Israel were in Egypt, yeah, stay with me. God only gave them the lamb. Just the lamb. And he said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over. So they were delivered from slavery through the blood of the lamb. Say amen. Good. Stay with me now. When they reached the Red Sea and the Pharaoh was coming behind them, they were now trapped. They needed now a second kind of deliverance. What was that? They needed to be delivered now, not from slavery. They got that with the lamb. They needed now to be delivered from the slave master's territory. And for that, it wasn't the blood. The blood of the lamb only delivered them from slavery, not the territory of the slave master. What delivered them from the territory of the slave master? The crossing of the Red Sea. In other words, baptism. Baptism delivered the, those who've been liberated from the slave master's territory. So after they crossed the Red Sea, they were no longer on Pharaoh's territory. Do you understand that, yes or no? Is that clear? You, you okay, brother? You all fine? Okay, good. So now, they were delivered completely by two things, blood and water. What came out from the side of Jesus when he was crucified? Blood and what? Water. Yes? Oh, so much in this little head. Something just came to my mind. I have to... Okay, I'm not going to say it now. Now, they are on whose territory? God's territory. And what is supposed to happen here? Relationship. When they got there, on this side, in the wilderness, God gave them what? Oh, you got one. What did God give them? Write it on the board. Or just draw it. You can write it or just draw the tables of stones. Yeah, you prefer to write it. Yeah, mechanics are not good at that. <laughs> mechanics are not good at drawing. God gave them what? The Ten Commandments. He did not give them the Ten Commandments when they were in Egypt. No way. Why? Because if he had done so, they would have gone and said, we got delivered because we were obedient. No. They were delivered by the blood of the Lamb. Now... To have a relationship with God, God gave them his law. Why? God will not have a relationship with disobedient people. Mm -mm. So, so the Ten Commandments are here in the middle. Because God is solving the problem of disorder. What brought about disorder? Disobedience. We have disorder in this world. Because two people were what? Disobedient. When you have obedience, you will have order. Is that, is that clear? It makes sense to you? So God is putting their lives back in order. But the law that they must keep must come from him. So he gave them ten commandments. And as they serve him and obey him, he could put their lives back in order. That's why the Ten Commandments are here in the middle in the wilderness. Amen, everybody. 
we just read from Revelation, where Jesus says, I am what? Alpha and what? Omega. What does the next verse say? Read it out loud. Blessed are they that do his what? Commandments. When, you, when, when the Bible says, blessed are they that do these commandments, they are now putting you and Jesus together. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So Jesus says, I am Alpha. I'm that by myself. I don't need your help. I don't need you. I went to the cross and I died by myself. When it comes to Omega, it's Jesus alone. But when it comes to sanctification, it's you and Jesus. That's why the Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments. It is a relationship between you and who? God. Now, I want to show you something. I'll just write it on the board quickly. <laughs> How many days did God take to put the earth in his light? Okay, I'm going to ask you again. Pause for a little bit. How many days did God take to put the earth in his light? One day. How many days did God take to fill the earth with his holiness? Okay, I'll help you out. One day. The Bible says God blessed the seventh day and made it what? Holy. Holiness is of God. It doesn't belong to the Sabbath. It belongs to God. God gave his holiness in the day. That's why the Sabbath is holy because of the presence of God. Amen. Between Solving the problem of darkness. Giving the earth his holiness on the seventh day. How many days do you have in between? Five days. I want you to see how fast it happens. Let there be light. Pow! There was light. The seventh day. God bless. Pow! Seven days holy. Just like that. You understand what I'm saying? Instant. Let it be light. There was light. Holy it. Seventh day is holy. But to put the earth in order, God took five days. That's why Jesus says, I am Alpha by myself because I could save you faster than you could pray. Lord Jesus, before you say Jesus, you're saved already. Because if God had to wait till some of us finish our prayer, you know how long it would take for us to be saved? <laughs> Jesus, they waiting to save you. Heavenly Father, you know, Lord, things were hard on me. Heavenly Father and Jesus, saved. just save the man and done with that. Eh? <laughs> saved. When it comes to glorification, what does the Bible say? How fast is that going to happen? The Bible says, by the twinkling of an eye, you shall be transformed or you'll be from what? From mortality into what? M immortality. So look at the board. Justification, like that. Glorification, like that. Why are these two so fast? Because it's Jesus alone. <laughs> it's Jesus alone. That's why it's so fast. He's that powerful. He saves you before. Isn't there a text in the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, that says, before you call, I will what? Answer. Why? He's doing it like that because he, it's on him. It's him alone. He has the power to do it. And when it comes to glorification, that's his power alone. It has nothing to do with you. But sanctification involves you. That's why it's so slow. Because today you pray, tomorrow you forget God. Get baptized and you're strong for the Lord. And yes, sanctification is going ahead. Spirit is working with you. You get up in the, in the morning. 
You read your Bible, you say your prayer, you're doing this, everything is fine, and then you're introduced to a movie on TV and you forget God. Somebody tell you something in church, you don't want to come to church no more. Pick up a boyfriend who's not Seventh-day Adventist, and you're gone with him. You ain't got time with church no more. Get involved with something, and you, you, it distracts you away from the Lord. That's why sanctification is taking so long. It's not because God doesn't have the power, but because this, he's not alone. It's God and you. And it does, sometimes he wants to work more, but you're not praying. You're not reading your Bible. You're not coming to church. You're not involved in any kind of conversation that will, that will strengthen you spiritually. Everything is internet and video games and movies and work. Some of you work so much you got no time for God. Got no time to read your Bible. No. We're so concerned about self and how we look and everything else. We got no time for God. So sanctification is slow. Are you understanding what I'm saying? God's law is here. Sanctification is here. After he redeems you. He wants to transform your life. And obedience is important. And now, I want to show you something beautiful in the Bible that the Lord showed me. When we hear of baptism, we think of baptism as entrance into our church. For example, you get baptized in a Pentecostal church, you Pentecostal. You get baptized in an evangelic church, you're evangelical. And the Adventist church is no different. People get baptized here, they are seven day Adventists. Because we think like that as Christians, we've taken away the true essence of baptism. Where baptism is, not, is, no, is no longer something that has to do with God himself. It has everything to do with our church. Just the church. I want to change that thinking that you have tonight. May, may I show you something in the Bible, sister? All right. It is God who wants a relationship with you, not the church. It is God that will sanctify you, not the church. Amen. It is God. So he has the power to do it. But he needs you to come through two things, blood and water. What does the blood mean? The blood symbolized, the blood represented what? The redeemer. And the water what? Creator. That's why. <laughs> you remember last night's message is that the, the redeemer takes the sinner that he redeemed to the creator. Because let me show you something. The responsibility of the redeemer is only to redeem, not to create. Creation is the responsibility of the creator. But the creator will not touch you because you're dirty. But the only way to recreate you is to touch you. How did God create man? By what? Y'all don't talk. By what? Touching the dirt. So if, you remember, there's a text in the Bible that says, if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new what? Creature. What does that mean? When it says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. He's, the, that text is talking about two people. It's talking about the Redeemer, Christ, and the Creator. If any man be in Christ, which is redeemed, he is now a new creature because the creator takes over. Is that clear, everybody? So this is why when Israel were in Egypt, the blood redeemed them, and then they were led to the water, representing now that the creator is about to work. Yeah? 
So when they got baptized, the creator starts his work of recreating because the redeemer did his job well. Is that clear? Wonderful. But God will not touch dirty. That's why baptism is important to God. I want you to forget you. Forget the church and think about God. Baptism is important to God, and we'll see it in the word of the Lord. Here we go. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis, the earth was covered with what? Water. God wanted to create man. He knew he was going to do that. What did he do, sister? He spoke to the water. What came up? Dry land. Stay with me. Dry land came up, brother. Now, this dry land came up. It was empty. But God spoke to the dry land. And everything God commanded the dry land to do, it did it. Let there be fruits. There were fruits. Yeah. Let there be animals. There were animals. Let there be this. Let there be that. Everything God commanded the dry land to produce, it did it. The dry land responded to the creator. Amen. Good. Now. God is ready to create man now. And he made a decision that he's going to create man from a material that had been responding to him for five days. <laughs> what is that material? Dirt. The dirt has been, had been responding to the voice of God. So he made a decision, I'm going to make man from the same dirt that had been responding to me. This is why when God created man, man had within him everything that he needed to respond to the voice of God. Because he was created from a material that was doing it all along. That's why Jesus says, if you, when the Pharisees and the priests wanted to stop the people from worshiping Jesus, when he entered Jerusalem, what did Jesus say? You stop them and what will cry out? The rocks will cry out. Why? Because the dirt that made those rocks had been responding to God before man had been, was created. So if man doesn't worship God, the earth will give him glory. Mm -hmm. All right. So God made man from the dirt. The same dirt that was hearing his voice for many days and responding. So Adam and Eve had already in them that desire for God. A desire for the voice of God. A desire. That's why it's impossible to be an atheist. <laughs> impossible. In every human being, there is a desire for God. They just don't want to serve the true God. Because atheists worship philosophers. That's why whether you want to or not, you go worship something. You understand, sister? All right, so God created man from the dirt. So now you have man. So let's start from the beginning. Water, stay with me. Woo hey, open your eye. Hey, water. Hmm? God spoke to the water. What came out of the water? Speak to me now. Dry land. Then he spoke to the dry land. And the dry land produces. It's produced. He used that same dirt and made what? Adam and Eve. He made man. Good. Let's go backward now. And you'll understand why baptism is important to God. Man, before God made man, this human being was dirt. This dirt was where? In the water. Mm -hmm. 
so man became a living creature because God touched dirt. Yeah? But that dirt was first in water. Which means before God could touch dirt, it must first come out of water. Mm -hmm. Say mm mm-hmm. And so ladies and gentlemen, that's why baptism is important to God. Because God never forgot that before he became redeemer, he had been creator all along. So baptism reminds God of his power to create. So when you get baptized, that's why baptism is in water. Because that dirt, filthy and unclean, goes back into the water. And what happens? It comes out of the water, clean dirt. That's why Peter said, when the people said, In Acts chapter 2, yeah. When they said, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Because when you get baptized, when you go down, your sins are clean. Why? Only clean dirt must come out of the water. Are you following me? When you go down in that water, your sins are gone. Your sins are washed away. Why? It's the only way God could touch you. Because it doesn't touch dirty. When you come out of that water, brother, you are now covered with the perfection of Jesus. Now he could touch you the same way he touched the dirt to create Adam. He could touch you now and make you a new creature. Do you understand baptism? This is not about the Adventist church. This is about God. It is about God making you a new creature. So I want you to see the the, the blood of the lamb permitted the people of God to approach the creator. They went through the Red Sea and came out clean dirt. So now God could put his hand on Israel and make them a kingdom of of priests, a holy nation, a royal priesthood in Jesus' name. Do you understand this message? See, this is why the devil doesn't want people to get baptized. Because he wants you to remain dirty. Because he knows God ain't going to touch you. Because he doesn't touch dirty. You understand, my brother? When you come here, Right here in the middle, now, you start your relationship with God because you're clean dirt now. He could touch you. He could walk with you. He could talk with you because he's not seeing you. You ever wondered why the Bible says that he will forgive your sins and remember them no more? How is it possible for God to forget? You know why he says, I remember your sins no more? Because every time he sees you, he doesn't see sin. He sees Jesus Christ. And because he sees his son, he doesn't see your sins. He sees Jesus Christ. That's why nobody is going to burn in hell because of sin. I say it again. Nobody is going to end up in hell, burn with Satan because of sin. Because sin is no longer between you and God. I'm right now completing a study on Colossians. And let me share with you a little piece. Sin is no longer between you and God. It is Jesus who is between you and God. So if you get to heaven, it will be because of Jesus. If you get to hell, it's because you reject Jesus. You need Jesus whether you want to get to heaven or hell. (laughs) If you want to get to heaven, you must accept Jesus. If you don't care and you want to burn in hell because you like the heat, 
you must reject Jesus. Because sin is no longer between God and man. It is Jesus. Jesus. Between you and God. And God says, I want to recreate you. I want a relationship with you. I want to put my hand on you. And let me tell you, when the hand of God is upon you, wherever you go, you are protected. I was doing a campaign in Martinique some years ago. And I was in a town where they was one of the central towns for, main towns for sorcery in Martinique. Mm-hmm. And the public radio station, not the Adventist station, the public radio stations asked if we can, if they can come and have the, the program live every night. I said, yes. We don't have to pay. And you know we like it when it's true. We ain't got to pay nothing. So they came every night. And they aired the sermon every night live. Across the island. I knew that in that town, sorcery was big. So the Lord put on my heart to present a message to break free those who were in bondage to sorcery. So I promoted it. I got to the program the night of that sermon. I saw the elders there in the vestry. They were just there. Mm. I said, What's going on? They said, brother, see that telephone there? It's been ringing all day. Just before you came, it's been ringing again and ringing again. I said, so what, what, why, why? He said, well, the sorcerers heard on the radio that you were going to preach a message to affect their business. And they told us to tell you to be careful. They said, if you preach that sermon tonight, they're going to use their sorcery against you. I said, well, next time the phone rings, you give them a message for me. You tell them, do not touch the Lord's anointed. You tell them, That we are on God's side. And tonight is going to be a battle between our God and their God. Let's see which God is going to win. Took that microphone, brother. And the spirit of the Lord moved. Preach that night, man. And we believe that people were set free. You know why? There were people in different parts of the island who heard the message. Who were tied down in sorcery. The following Sabbath, they took their cars, came to the church for baptism. When the hand of God is over your life, he takes care of you, sister. Now you learn to live by grace. And when you learn to live by grace, you keep this in mind. God doesn't have to give you the food. He doesn't have to heal you. He doesn't have to give you the money. He doesn't have to. Why? You have him. <laughs> and if you have him and you're in a relationship with him, you live according to his will. And that is not easy for many people. But that is Christianity in the desert. There is no hospital there. There's no supermarket there. But here is the good news. God said, I will provide all your needs. According to my riches in glory. Which means, if what you want, I don't have it in glory, you're not getting it. <laughs> Keep that in mind. According to my riches in glory. The name of God's supermarket is glory. 
So if you're asking God for something and he goes into his supermarket, glory, and he don't have it, you're not getting it. (laughs) The name of his bank is glory. If the money you're asking for, the bank manager says, no, you're not getting it. According to his riches in glory, not according to your desire. You could have how much desire you want. It is according to God's riches in glory. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Christianity in the desert. That is living by grace. That is how God recreates you, put his hand on new, clean dirt again. Has it been a blessing for you tonight? Amen? Amen? If you're not yet baptized here, you need to. Why? Because we understand here sanctification. We understand that, yes, it is by grace that you are saved, but it is through faith. And the Bible says, faith establishes. Remember what we learned the other day. How how do you worship and serve God as the creator? Only through obedience. Because Adam and Eve were given that law. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was a law given to them. And they only knew God as creator, not redeemer, because they didn't sin. So that means if if Adam and Eve had never sinned, today we we would know God only as creator nobody on the earth would have known Jesus as redeemer because man would not have sinned the only way to have a relationship with the creator is to obey the creator is that clear I don't know who here is not yet baptized I don't know who here has been, has backslidden. But even if you're already baptized, your concept of baptism must change. It's not about this church. It's about God. It's about allowing allowing God to work his work as the creator, to recreate you, so you can be a new creature. There's no service tomorrow night, but Sabbath morning, We come back right here, and I'm going to show you more of this concept. Did you understand? If tonight's presentation has been a blessing to you, sister, and you want to say, Father, work in me as my creator, recreate me. I understand now why I got baptized. It was so that new dirt could come out of that water so you could touch me. Put your hand on me, Father, and do your will. If you want him to work in your life, to bring about that sanctification in a relationship with him, come to this altar and pray about it. I am thine, O Lord. I am heard I and it Whether you're baptized already or not, me. but you understand now why but I long you did get baptized. If you're not yet baptized, you come also and, be and say, Lord, I want that in my life. I want to come out of that water, new draw dirt. Me come and pray. Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. 
the objective of tonight's message is to point your mind back to the Creator. To show you how the Redeemer takes your hands, saves you, covers you with His perfection, brings you to the Creator. Creator doesn't see your sins, he sees the perfection of the Redeemer. And now he could have a relationship with you. He can put his hand on you because you're clean dirt now. in that way we think of it only as a ritual a ceremony that turns us into Adventists so we didn't think of God we thought of the church it has always been about God serve him sister honor him submit to his hand and recreate you. Submit to him, young boys. Let him recreate you. Some of you, physically, you did not leave the church, but spiritually, you are backslidden a long time. Come back home. If your life to the Redeemer because you cannot go to the Creator for recreation on your own. You got to go there with the Redeemer. And the Redeemer says, Father, I brought him. I've covered him. Receive me. Forgive him. Please touch him, Father. And the Father says, Yes. This boy. Father, put your hand on us and let the process of sanctification, of recreation, take hold of our lives. We know, Lord, that you are so happy when you can use your creative power on us. I believe personally, Lord, that when you, when a sinner comes to you through the redemptive power of Jesus, it, it gives you joy to do upon this dirt as you did in Genesis. It gives you joy to take your hand and recreate this individual. It gives you joy to breathe into this individual, a fresh breath of life through the Holy Ghost. It gives you joy to then speak to this individual and say, if you love me, keep my commands. And just like Adam and Eve, this individual then says, yes. Please bless everyone here. That we submit to your creative power. Thank you for keeping us safe and bring us all back Sabbath morning more of your word continue to speak to the hearts of our visiting friends and families that we've been inviting we've been encouraging we are glad that our sister Jani has been coming and others please continue to let conviction remain in their soul until Sabbath Lord thank you in Jesus name Amen Give somebody a good hug of love, a shake hand of love.
Don't forget the preacher. Hello? 